Welcome to Net Tuesday. Thanks to everyone who braved the rain, although it's not raining now. I don't know what the big fuss was, um, but it'll be raining again, I suspect. So um, I'm going to make a couple of opening remarks and turn this over. We have a, a busy, packed kind of evening um, with a familiar um, format. So just a little bit about Philly Net Squared. Um, there are a bunch of Net Squareds around the world, of which this is one of them. And they tend to have different themes, but they're all centered around the same general theme of helping nonprofits and social causes using uh, social technology. We tend to use the phrase of using the social web for social change. The main thing we do are these Net Tuesday events, which are the first Tuesday of every month. Um, and on the second Tuesday, we have a planning meeting. And these planning meetings, the last couple of months, have been by conference call. So anyone who's interested in helping to uh, think about this stuff as we move forward can, um, you know, is invited to participate in those conference calls, and it's pretty accessible and usually an interesting conversation. We also have a website and a Google group. Uh, the Google group gets uh, sporadic use, various use. It goes up and down in terms of people asking for information and help or advice about doing something or making an announcement or some other sort of thing relevant to the group. These are the Net Tuesdays that we've done in the past year. The highlighted ones uh, show that we're using, we've used this format every couple of months, the crowdsourcing change format. And you can see some of the recent um, uh, subjects of, of, of that format, as well as other topics related to the general theme of the social web um, for social change. Looking forward, as I mentioned, next week we'll have a planning conference call. Um, see me if you are interested in that. I'll give you the information. And on Tuesday, October 2nd, we have a, uh, a, a popular speaker, Will Reynolds, who's going to talk about search engine optimization. Um, for those who don't know, that, that's about how to uh, help your website be more easily um, accessed in the world out there. In addition to being in this room, we are um, cyberly communicating through the world. There are a couple of um, cameras up here. And we're streaming this um, out on the internet through either of those links. And we're also supporting a Twitter back channel using the hashtag of uh, PHLNET2. So Andrew, who is not, who, who just left and will come back, um, is monitoring the Twitter back channel. And if there are people out there in the cyber world who have some sort of comment or question, it may come in through him in that respect. Uh, in addition to the events themselves, we're really about networking. So please fill in the sign-in sheet and leave a business card. I will uh, take that sign-in sheet and, and redistribute the contact information just to the people within this room, and I'll scan the business cards and send those back out to people in the room. If there are some blank business cards. Feel free to um, enhance your identity if you like. Um, if you have a double-sided business card, please leave two. It makes it easier to uh, copy. Uh, you'll notice that we also have these tag tags uh, where you can name yourself and also tag yourself with another, um, some sort of uh, other information, and that's an opportunity to network with other people and, um, uh, uh, you know, just generally get to know other people in some way. On the back is more information about uh, the next stuff coming up and some of the other information went over. We have a strict no questions too stupid policy, and um, we invite everyone to be able to ask the questions they want, get their needs met, because it's not only the needs of the folks who are up here talking about the websites, but we're all learners here and we're all sharers. So there's something for each of us to try and get out of the evening, and it's really up to people themselves to really ask the questions that they need to be able to get the answers that would help them. A little bit of housekeeping. There's some food up here. We don't want to leave any, so please let's finish it. We do do composting and recycling, and there's uh, appropriate marked containers there. The bathrooms are outside in the hallway, right past the elevators. We have Wi-Fi access in this building. It's the AFSC network, and it's open. You don't need a password. As I mentioned, we are um, video streaming and video recording this event. If for any reason you would like not to be on videotape, um, there's a video-free zone over there in the corner, kind of where Lamar is sitting. And um, people are invited to stay over there, and we'll keep you off of camera if that's the case. The other piece of housekeeping about that is that we're using microphones, 
And be aware that we're using it not so much so that you can be heard within the room, but because the stream and the recording are much better if people actually speak into the microphones. So we'll ask your patience for doing that. We have a wireless and we'll walk it around the room for um, that kind of conversation. Uh, we also do have parking validation. If you go to the front desk with a parking, uh, a parking stub from the lot across the street, I think it's $10 or, or it's, it's some significant discount. And everyone is invited to come out for a bite or a drink afterwards and continue the conversation. Our sponsor is the American Friends Service Committee, which is one of the tenants of this building. And the AFSC does peace and social justice work around the world. Um, sometimes some surprising stuff. There was a Libyan delegation in here this morning. I'm not sure what they were talking about. Um, and that's really about what we have to talk about as we go forward. The thing I'd like to do at this point is ask people to introduce themselves briefly and just to say who they are um, and maybe why they're here and to wait for the uh, microphone as you go to do that. So uh, again, my name is Seth Horowitz. I do work with the American Friends Service Committee um, and I have been uh, working with this uh, that Tuesday for the last uh, four years. Hi, I'm Ellen Marshall. Um, I've worked with a number of nonprofits, and I'm particularly interested in social media. Hi, I'm Barry Becker with Perimeter World Productions, and we do a lot of work in the nonprofit uh, sphere as well. I'm, <clears throat> I'm Michael Schweisheimer, also with Primitive World Productions, and uh, yeah, we focus on doing video productions for nonprofits. Hi, I'm Christy Wilson. I uh, work part-time in San Francisco and part-time in Philadelphia. work for a company called Splunk, which is a big data company and run, in addition to being the VP of product operations, Splunk for Good, the corporate social responsibility program. And I also volunteer on the board of a nonprofit in San Francisco, which is NAMI SF. Hi, my name is Louise Salinas, and I work for another Quaker organization in this building, but we're the one that kind of does peace building within the Religious Society of Friends. Hi, Mindy Weinberg. I'm uh, with UPenn Libraries, and I work in the communications area and would like to uh, learn as much as I can about social media. I'm Faye Anderson with the Cost of Freedom Project, and I've crowdsourced two civic apps, Cost of Freedom Voter ID app and one that's under development, Yo! Philly Votes. Faye is being modest. She's very involved in the voter ID um, uh, resistance of, of the uh, current law to suppress votes. And if anyone is interested, I think they can talk to her about more information for that. My name is Lamar Kendrick, and I come to Net Tuesday because I'm interested in creating community both online and off, and have been involved for many, many years in doing so. Offline, it is, most recently on. I'm Rita Varley, and I'm here for multiple reasons. I came with, um, at first interested in seeing what's possible for the Philadelphia Yearly Meeting Library, and I'm also getting very involved in uh, city activism with um, Transition Philadelphia and uh, my community, hoping, hoping to participate in developing uh, far northeast Philadelphia. Um, community garden um, group and also um, other local groups. Hi, everybody. I'm Doug Barg, and I'm starting to dry out after walking over here. I noticed that the rain has stopped once we've arrived. Um, I am the founder of Kitchen Cred. Kitchen Cred is a collaborative that empowers youth through nutrition knowledge, kitchen competency, and culminates in a culinary competition. And I'm happy to say since last month's meeting, um, we were selected as one of three winners of the Independence Blue Cross Game Changers Challenge, which has changed the game for us dramatically, I can tell you. Um, I'd like to extend an invitation as a result of that kick in the butt. Um, we are stepping up our game and looking to create a logic model in a one-day marathon session that we're calling a, a massively engaged planning session. I thought about calling it a massively engaged strategy session, but the acronym wasn't quite where we wanted it to be. 
Um, and I'd like to invite everybody here, if you're interested, uh, to come and join us on September 22nd. It'll be a, a full day long session. Um, and we're looking to call on the wisdom of the crowd. So thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Dave. I'm with the Presbyterian Historical Society, and I'm interested in learning uh, how nonprofits can use uh, social media. Hi, my name is Greg Sullivan. I'm an independent contractor. I do software project and product management. I'm certainly interested in learning uh, how social media can be used uh, in the not-for-profit world to promote causes. <laughs> Hi, I'm Lauren Drinker. Um, I am a communications consultant, um, mainly with the Garden Club of America, developing their website, um, but overall just nonprofit organizations. And um, I'm interested in this whole topic and, and people that work in this industry and I'm particularly interested in the Lupus Foundation. So that's why I'm here. Hi, my name is Andrew Sather. I work at Jenkins Law Library down the street and I I love uh, to come here. I love all these events, especially the crowdsourcing change events. And today, as in the past couple of uh, past couple of Net Tuesdays, I am the voice of Twitter. So, if there is someone offsite who is streaming, uh, who has a suggestion for our participants or a question, I will attempt to vocalize those suggestions or questions in the best way I possibly can. Uh, my name is Mary, and I do project management for a company at the University of Pennsylvania, and I also sit on a board of directors for a summer camp that I'm trying to bring into the 21st century by getting them on par with social media. Hi, my name is Tim Siftar, and I'm the librarian for information science and technology and education at Drexel University, and I'm here just to keep up with things going on. I am Fitzgerald Putnam. Uh, I'm an IT consultant here at the AFSC. I work from home this afternoon, but didn't have enough rain in my life. <laughs> um, hello, my name is Patty Bonney, and I am a change management consultant, change management training, project management. I've worked both in the nonprofit and the for profit industry. And I'm actually here as an invitation from Doug. So looking um, at possible facilitation methods for um, the big planning session going on, as well as just my general knowledge in social media. Hi, my name is Brianna Morgan. I'm here from the Office of HIV Planning, which is a health planning organization. Um, among other things, I manage our website and our social media accounts. So I am here for the third time trying to learn ways to better engage the community and improve our HIV care and prevention services. And I'm Rob Reichert. I'm the executive director of the AIDS Fund, and I'm excited to see how people are using social media. Great, thank you. Um, a couple things I just forgot to mention. One is that um, Tim Siftar is sitting back there and has volunteered, at least until he leaves, to be helping to take notes. So um, after the presentation, when we have Q&A and people are coming up with suggestions, we'll try and take some brief bulleted notes and project them up here so that people can see what's happening and maybe make some connections. And of course, that'll be available afterwards. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say is that we are very informal here. So please feel free to get up during um, as things are going along, get some food, go to the bathroom. If you want to check out the Twitter stream, you can look over Andrew's shoulder. If you want to see something about the internet stream and how the room works, you can look over Fitz's shoulder. And um, everyone is, is open to that sort of participation. So let's just um, you know, feel informal and invited to uh, enjoy yourself. At this point, I'm going to hand it over to Denny, and she'll introduce what's happening. Is this working? Yes. OK. Hi, I'm Denny Kazarel. I'm the moderator of tonight's event. And I work for a company here in Philadelphia called Health Partners. I do online and new media strategy, and I also do some consulting. Um, and just before we start tonight, I just want to give one little quick plug for next month, just so you don't forget, because I don't know how many people of you have ever heard of Will uh, Reynolds, but he is fantastic, and he is highly sought after, and the presentation that he's going to be giving is on search, search engine optimization and social media, so it's not just going to be about meta tags or just sort of the very basics, you know, 101. It's going to be a really fascinating uh, presentation, and like I said, he 
he talks all over the country. He is in very high demand. So I'm just putting in a plug just so, you know, so, you know, and I hope to be here for that as well. But um, if you do come here, I would imagine it will be well worth your while. Okay. So uh, now we'll move on to tonight's program, which is crowdsourcing change. So how many people have been to a crowdsourcing change event before? Okay. All right. So I'll just explain it real quick. The way that it works is that we have our presenters here. And uh, each presenter, we go individually. Um, each one gives a presentation. They'll explain a little bit about their organization, what they do, what their mar marketing strategies are, how they're using social media, and then talk about what they want to accomplish through social media. As you'll see with at least some of these um, organizations tonight, they have specific projects that are coming up in the near future that they may want to focus on a little more. Um, but in any case, that's what they do, so they'll explain that. And then uh, we open up the floor to the crowd. So we're using crowdsourcing in our, in our own special way here. But, uh, and then you're the crowd, and basically they're just sort of picking your brains or you know, gathering your knowledge. And so you'll see um, there are a set of questions that are just sort of preliminary questions that they've told us that they are interested in getting some responses to. But just whatever you hear, you, as they give in their presentation, um, they'll just be things that will come up. And then you're here to offer your feedback, either as suggestions or maybe they're doing something and you tried something another way and you know it's, it was successful, or maybe you tried something that they're doing and it wasn't successful, and so you might also, that's also valuable to know. So in any case, you're the crowd that they're sourcing, and we're going to go in the order of these th three groups, um, and that's, that's basically how it works. Um, and just one thing to note, um, I do try to keep kind of strictly to the time limits just so that everyone gets their time allotment and so that the last person link doesn't just get a few minutes. So um, if by chance there's a lot of questions and at some point I just need to cut it off, there's also a half hour afterwards uh, after everybody's presented where we sort of open it up to anyone if there's any questions left or there's also time that if you want to individually meet and talk to any of the presenters, you have time for that as well. So. Um, as I said, just, you know, don't take it personally if I have to just kind of cut it at, at a certain point. So that's it. Now uh, I'm going to talk about the presenters. So Big Brothers, Big Sisters, Southeastern PA. How many people here have heard of Big Brothers or Big Sisters? Okay. I figured as much. They're very well known and we're very happy to have them here tonight. Um, they are a donor and volunteer supported organization that enriches, encourages, and empowers children to reach their highest potential through safe one-on-one -on -one mentoring relationships. I'm sure you've heard of someone who is either a big brother or a big sister who is mentoring uh, a child. Um, and uh, each year they have more, they reach out to uh, more than 3,500 children in the greater Delaware Valley and uh, who are able to achieve success either socially or academically, personally, just uh, by virtue of the fact that they have someone there who is helping them along in their life. So the two presenters for Big Brothers and Big Sisters are Liz Semin. Am I going to try to pronounce your name right? Okay. Uh, she's the Marketing and Communications Coordinator, and Ted Qualley, uh, who's the uh, Vice President of External Affairs and Marketing. Uh, and... Um, the questions that Big Brothers and Big Sisters would like our crowd to present, are we going to show that or not? I can read them if there's, okay. So, okay, so uh, these are the questions, and like I said, they're just sort of to stoke interest. So as you give your presentation or if they mention other things, these we're not limited to these, and they're just to get some wheels turning, but what strategies can we use to increase engagement among our current followers? How can we use our social media time more efficiently, which I'm sure many people can relate to, and hopefully we'll have suggestions for that. What metrics should we be tracking to determine success in social media? How can we increase our numbers of social media followers? So um, that's their set of questions, and we'll look forward to your presentation. I'm just going to just introduce all the presenters first, and then, and then we'll start. Okay, so um, now Lupus Foundation of America, the Philadelphia Tri-State Chapter, um, so how many people here, this is a two-phase question, have heard of lupus and know what it is? Wow. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. I'm, that's good. So, 
Okay. All right. Anyway, all right. So um, the Philadelphia Tri-State Chapter is an affiliate of the Lupus Foundation of America, which is the uh, foremost national nonprofit voluntary health organization dedicated to finding the causes of and cure for lupus and for providing support, services, and hope for all people afflicted by lupus, which, you know, is actually probably a larger population than some people may realize. Um, so um, the chapter serves uh, southeastern PA, southern New Jersey, and all of Delaware. And um, they have their largest event of the year is the Lupus Loop, uh, which is coming up on October 28th. And so I'm sure that Annette will be talking about that, but that's one of the, as I mentioned, some of the presenters may be specifically sort of homing in on some events. But anyways, that's one, one event at least that they're going to want to source our crowd for some suggestions as to how to use social media to uh, generate excitement and engagement and uh, make that a big success. So the questions that the Lupus Foundation would like to ask is, as a small staff with lots to do, how can we keep a sustained social media presence? That's a very common situation. Um, how do we encourage deeper engagement with constituents via social media tools? And how many people, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the last one is just many people with lupus are not public about having it for a variety of reasons. How can we use social media to help overcome that barrier? So that's something sometimes that's common with health conditions where people, you know, are just not as forthcoming. So how can social media help, uh, help overcome that? So um, we'll be getting to those questions following that presentation. And last but not least is the AIDS Fund, uh, which supports HIV AIDS education prevention and services in the Delaware Valley region uh, by raising dollars and increasing public awareness about the impact of HIV in our communities. Um, the, the fund currently uh, ser serves uh, 30 regional agencies who receive uh, funds from the AIDS Fund uh, to provide direct services and AIDS prevention initiatives. And just some of those um, agencies are Action AIDS, AIDS Law Project of Pennsylvania, the Bashi and the Mazzoni Center, which some, some people here have likely heard of, at least some of those. Um, but they have 30 in all. And uh, while the uh, organization uses social media for a variety of purposes, um, they're also wanting to put some special focus on event. Theirs is the AIDS Walk and AIDS Run Philly, uh, which this year I believe is the first year you're doing the run, is it? No? I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> Scratch that. But anyway, the AIDS Walk Run Philly, and that's on October 21. And uh, so uh, some of the things perhaps that you'll be talking about um, with uh, the Lupus Foundation will apply because you have similar types of events there. Uh, and the presenter is uh, Stephanie Lin, who is the uh, Corporate and Community Relations Coordinator. And I realize, I'm sorry, Anita, I forgot to introduce <laughs> Anita. Uh, Myrick? Annette, I'm sorry. Oops. Annette Myrick, who is the CEO of the Lupus Foundation, so, so I apologize for that. Um, and then Stephanie Lin, who's the Corporate and Community Relations Coordinator for the AIDS Fund. So um, we will start with Big Brothers and Big Sisters and take it away. All right. So um, I'm Ted Qualley. I'm the Vice President of External Affairs and Marketing for Big Brothers Big Sisters Southeastern PA. And um, we serve Chester, Delaware, Montgomery, and Philadelphia County. So we serve four of the traditional five Southeastern PA counties. Um, as was stated, you know, essentially our mission is to sort of help level the playing field for these kids. Um, we serve children facing adversity, uh, and we, what we do is we provide them with carefully screened, trained adult volunteer mentors and one-to-one -one mentoring relationships. And we, we do that in an effort to help these kids uh, have higher aspirations, greater confidence, avoid risky behaviors, um, and hopefully have uh, positive educational outcomes. Uh, Big Brothers Big Sisters is, is, is often thought of as the premier one-to-one -one youth mentoring organization, and I'll get into that. Uh, why that is a little bit later, um, but a lot of it has to do with the efficacy of the model and the research that's been conducted around Big Brothers Big Sisters one-to-one -one mentoring. Uh, we have about 60-some staff across those four counties, and uh, last year we served a little more than 3,500 children with 3,500 adult volunteer mentors. Um, and so when you add that all up, it gets us a little north of 7,000 uh, children and adults in the program. 
we uh, refer to our adult volunteer mentors as bigs and the kids in our program as littles, hence big brothers, big sisters, each having a little brother and or little sister. So we have two basic programs, um, and they're differentiated by where the mentoring takes place. Most people that think of Big Brothers Big Sisters mentoring, when they, when they think about that, they think about their community-based program. And so in the community-based program, a volunteer mentor goes to pick up his little brother, or she goes to pick up their little sister at their house, and then they spend the day in the community. They could run errands, they could go to a museum, they could go to a Phillies game, but the mentoring, the time that they spend together, that it takes place in the community. The other program that we have is a site-based program. And so that mentoring takes place at a specific location. It could be a corporation, it could be a school, it could be a college, it could be a place like the center we're in right now. Uh, last year, across the four counties, we served 1,300, a little bit more than 1,300 children in the community-based program. And within that program, we do have um, targeted efforts and or initiatives. So within the community-based program, sorry. Okay. You're all right. So uh, within the community-based program, we do have some targeted initiatives. So Big Brothers Big Sisters has been around for over 100 years, and our agency in particular will celebrate its 100th anniversary in 2015. During that time, we've always served children with a parent in jail, uh, just by virtue of who we were serving in, in the cities that we were in. However, not until about 2001, when we partnered with Public-Private Ventures and former Mayor Wilson Good and about 60 congregations to actively serve children with a parent in jail and created the Amachi Mentoring Children and Prisoners program, did we target a specific population. And so that program has since been replicated in 48 states and about a dozen countries um, nationwide. More than 100,000 children have been involved in that Amachi Mentoring Children and Prisoners program that started right here in Philadelphia. Uh, the mentoring district is, again, it's a community-based mentoring program, but in this instance, it's targeting kids in a very specific geographic region of Philadelphia. In this instance, it's the 24th, 25th, and 26th police districts. And the reason we chose those districts and the reason we created this program was because the Philadelphia Department of Human Services is, is in the process of rolling out a new initiative called Improving Outcomes for Children. And essentially, they're trying to... Um, put the social work into the hands of community providers, uh, with the thinking being that the folks that live and, and work in these communities know the children and the resources and the challenges better than anyone else that, you know, from downtown would ever know. And so they're going to work more closely with these um, local provider agencies, more grassroots. And so they focused on those three police districts because those three police districts lead the city in the number of kids being removed from their homes and placed in the foster care. And when you lay that map over with a map that looks at where those kids get placed, unfortunately, it's well outside of their, their neighborhoods. And so they lose the continuity with their school and with their family members and things like that. And so it's just an additional disruption in their lives. So the city began to focus on the 24th, 25th, and 26th for those reasons, and, and additionally, some of the violence and the poverty and all these other uh, risk factors. And so we thought it would be a good idea to write a grant to try to support the city in those efforts. We called it the Mentoring District. And so, again, it's basically our community-based mentoring program. We're asking volunteers to, to mentor kids who happen to live in that geographic region. It's the only difference between that program and any of the other community-based mentoring programs we have. Our site-based mentoring program um, has really exploded in recent years. So for the first 80 or 90 years of Big Brothers Big Sisters, it was all community-based. Um, but as you'll see, last year we served more than 2,200 kids in our site-based program. Um, we're you know, approaching almost double the size of the community-based program. And the reason behind this is the community-based program is sort of one child, one mentor, one address at a time. Whereas in a site-based program, we can now look at an entire classroom or an entire school. And we can work with the teachers and the principals, and they can help us identify numerous kids in need. And then we can try to identify a volunteer source because we need one volunteer for every single child because all of our mentoring is one-to-one. -one. And so we are fortunate, as, as many of you know, to have so many colleges and universities around uh, the region here. And so we have a program called College Bigs where college students – mentor nearby elementary and middle school students. In fact, we have the largest college bigs program in the nation. At our peak, we had 500 University of Penn students mentoring kids from five different elementary schools around the University of Penn campus. 
We have partnerships with Temple and LaSalle, Ursinus, Widener, St. Joe's, and Philadelphia University. And um, it's fantastic. And, and the college students will work with them in their sort of going into their sophomore year. Um, and that way they can maintain almost a three-year mentoring relationship with these kids. Uh, we'll also have corporate banks. And so there are some uh, specifically charter schools in Center City that are pretty close within walking distance to, to um, many corporations. And so that provides us access, again, to volunteers. And so we have relationships with a lot of the schools in downtown where the volunteers can leave work during their lunch hour, go to the school, still meet one-on-one -on -one with the child, um, but it happens at their school. And then a few years back, in 2006, um, in an effort to try and serve some kids in uh, neighborhoods that we just historically couldn't get volunteers to go, um, particularly in North Philadelphia, when homicides were sort of going through the roof in 2007, we had a really difficult time getting volunteers to go into certain neighborhoods because a lot of people don't know the neighborhoods other than what they read in the newspaper or see on television. And so we flipped our distribution channel. We decided we're going to start taking the kids to the mentors as opposed to always bringing the, the, the mentors to the kids. We created a program called Beyond School Walls, and we started with Cigna, which is in one or two Liberty Place, and Pratt Elementary School in North Philadelphia. We had tried to serve kids in Pratt Elementary School for about four years and weren't able to ever get any sort of critical mass. And so um, we started this partnership with Cigna. Cigna pays for the program and allows their employees to volunteer as mentors. And what we do is we put those kids on a bus and we take them to Cigna every week. And it happens over lunch break. And the Cigna employees come down to the lunchroom and there's lunch provided for them. And they meet one-on-one -on -one still with the, with the kids in the program. And um, everything, every other aspect is still Big Brothers Big Sisters mentoring. It just takes place at the corporate workplace. And so now we're realizing that there's all this additional benefit. These kids are being exposed to a positive work environment. They're being exposed to adults that get up and go to work every day. They're being exposed to women in suits. Some of these kids never have seen or even thought about something like that. And as, as, as commonplace as it may be for us, not until we had a child in an elevator and he said that was the first time he had ever been in an elevator, did it really start to dawn on us. And we're relatively shrewd, and so we started to measure the impact on the employees as well. Um, and we found out that the employees felt much better about working there. They felt that this was an excellent use of community investment dollars. They told us that they were practicing skills that they later used in the workplace when they were talking to their littles. And so this has allowed us to sell it to multiple corporations. It started in 2006. We have 22 corporations on board today. Comcast rolled it out in 11 other cities across the country um, because they were so happy with the program locally. And a philanthropic group called 100 Women in Hedge Funds which is far bigger than 100 women, um, but they are, are associated with hedge funds, invested a million dollars into Big Brothers Big Sisters of America to leverage additional corporate investments nationwide for this program. Again, that started here in Philadelphia. It's been awesome because it provides us access to funding that we desperately need. It allows us to serve kids who we would otherwise struggle to serve. And finally, um, it helps us get to men. And we struggle to recruit men. And so one of the things that Liz is going to talk about, one of the areas where we're very interested in exploring social media, is how to attract men. Our mantra is we need money and men. You know, we need money and men to make the matches because our waiting list is enormous. Um, it's comprised mostly of kids 7 to 14 years old. They're facing some level of risk or adversity. Um, and, you know, if you draw this continuum and at the low risk end, you have children perhaps in a two-parent household, uh, maybe with a lot of aunts and uncles, attending a, a well-resourced school. On the very other end, you have kids that are just experiencing a whole host of issues. They might be involved with the Department of Human Services. Dad may be in jail. Um, it's just a, a brother may be uh, in and out of the system, delinquent, dependent, those sorts of things. And there may be too many issues for a volunteer to provide and to help this child. So we sort of focus our efforts and our resources in the middle. Uh, children with an incarcerated parent, absolutely within our sort of wheelhouse. Uh, kids attending some of the, the, the most under-resourced or most dangerous schools, absolutely. So that's sort of where we focus. However, as we realized earlier, so many people know Big Brothers Big Sisters, we're a first call for help a lot. And so when a mom or a grandmom or a single dad realizes that they need someone in their child's life to help fill that sort of mentoring role, um, they call us. And so we have a lot of kids on our waiting list. We're always recruiting bigs or volunteers. Um, and at the end of the day, you don't have to sort of be Superman or anything like that. Y you need to enjoy meeting new people, making friends. Um, you know, you have to be willing to, to spend some time. And at, the, at, at its core, it's consistency. So we ask each volunteer mentor to meet with these children 
with their little brother or little sister between two and four times a month for at least a year. And we do that because the research says that if we get them to a year, that's when the most positive outcomes happen. If it only lasts three months, then we've done more damage to the child. It's yet another adult failing them. Um, and the consistency has been documented through the research to be uh, as such that it produces the outcomes that we want to see. And if you sort of step back and think about it, anyone who's ever been successful will at least point to one person in their life that cared about them, that had expectations for them. Um, and so many of these kids don't have that. Or the one person that they do have is so overwhelmed or dealing with so many additional stressors that they might not be able to dedicate the amount of time um, to the child that they would like to. And so that's sort of where Big Brothers Big Sisters comes in. Um, what sets us apart, am I going too long? Five minutes, okay. So if I could sum up this one slide, <clears throat> what sets us apart, obviously we have to protect the kids in our program. It's huge and it's one of the main reasons why we dove into social media waters way late because we understood that this is gonna provide strangers into our world, so we were very careful about that. But rigorous screening and ongoing support to make sure that the kids are safe and that the rules are being followed, they're two of the reasons that every researcher has pointed to as to why we're successful. Um, essentially, our mentors help the kids improve in the area down the left column. Parental trust, social acceptance, those things have been associated, <coughs> excuse me, with um, the behavioral changes in the middle, which research has shown helps these kids get better grades, test scores, graduation rate, et cetera, et cetera. All the research that's been done nationwide, which has been inclusive of Philadelphia kids, has shown that the kids are essentially less likely to do drugs, drink alcohol, skip school, hit someone, lie to their parents. Um, African-American um, African -American youth were actually 70% less likely to begin using illegal drugs than the entire cohort of the children, which you're seeing there at 46%. Um, which included, you know, all, all sorts of races. Um, University of Colorado has evaluated 900 programs with the most rigorous set of uh, standards in the field looking at violence prevention, and only 11 have earned blueprint status, and so we're very proud of one of those, again, getting back to the efficacy to the blueprint model. Um, and then locally, we've seen some pretty impressive results as well. We do have our challenges, and that's what Liz is going to talk a little bit about. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's money and men, because as you see, 1,200 children on the waiting list, 800 of which are boys. Because if we did, if I asked everyone in this room to volunteer, seven out of ten hands would be raised. It's not unique to Big Brothers Big Sisters. It's not unique um, to Philadelphia. It's sort of nationwide. You volunteer. It's it's guys are. And we've, we've we've sat down with experts. We've done research. Part of it's the commitment word. Um, <laughs> candy. And um, we we ask a lot because for the program to be effective, we deliver it very deliberately. If that makes sense. We'll put out ads asking. We only need men and get more responses Female from responses. females, even though we're just saying we need men. All right, so our social media. So we're currently on four different platforms, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Google+. So we'll just start to go through them one by one about what we're currently doing and then uh, try and figure out how we can improve in each of them. So Facebook. This is a snapshot of our Facebook page from a couple of days ago. We currently have um, over 1,000 followers, and I think everyone wants to have more. Uh, we try and have a good variety of what we post on here, and this is probably the platform that we do the best work in. Um, we'll talk about our upcoming events, like this one on here, Fashion for a Cause, a fashion show that's going on in Ambler with some of our matches in October. Um, we have free and discount offers for our bigs and littles, uh, so we'll post those on there. Um, we've been trying more and more to use it as a place for partner recognition, so if we just received a grant and the, the person giving us the grant is on Facebook, giving a post, tagging them in it so they see that we're recognizing them publicly. Um, we also use it to tell stories. We'll post uh, a little snippet of uh, our success stories that will link them to our website to read more about it. Um, we'll talk about male recruitment, women out there, tell a guy you know to sign up to be a big brother. Um, we'll ask people to donate occasionally or tell them about our fundraising events that's going on. We find that our main audience here, uh, from what we can tell, is our volunteers in the program. Um, and some of the strategies we're currently using are uh, contests. So when we were trying to get to a thousand followers, we had a contest saying, 
tell your friends to join. After we hit a thousand, we're going to randomly select people of the group to get gift cards to iTunes. <laughs> so I think tomorrow we're announcing the first like randomly selected winner. Um, also, like I said earlier with tagging, whenever we can tag partners and just show them that we're appreciating them more, we've been trying to do that. Um, and then to engage people more on the site, uh, to get more comments and likes. Recently, we've been saying like this, if you, you know, ran the, the uh, marathon with your little brother or whatever, did something like that. Uh, Twitter, we have about half as many followers on Twitter. We just started this about a year ago. Um, we post a lot less frequently than on Facebook, probably once or twice a week. Um, We'll link more to articles or uh, put more statistics or outcomes on here. And we find that more of our audience here are corporations, um, not as many volunteers. So it's a little bit different focus. Um, and, you know, we've been trying to follow as many people as we can to get them to follow back and keep up with what they're doing. Um, retweeting people or, you know, retweeting with comment and mentioning people as much as we can. Google Plus. I don't know if anyone is on Google Plus, but we don't really know what's going on here. We have 23 followers after a couple months. Uh, we've probably made a dozen posts, maybe. Uh, we'll post the same stuff on Facebook because I can't really tell a difference. No one's been commenting or doing anything. And, uh, but when it takes off, we're there. Yeah. <laughs> we're already set. We're already set. Yeah. Uh, and finally, uh, YouTube. So we have a a lot of videos posted on our page um, and sometimes we'll put them on our Facebook page or things like that but we, we really haven't done much with publicizing our YouTube page it's mainly where we store our videos and if we're sending them out for any reason uh, we just grab them from there but honestly we haven't spent much time in trying to organize the page or figure out how to organize it and even when we're searching for ourselves it never even brings us to the right page unless we uh, go to the link there. Um, so what we use to kind of uh, keep everything in place is um, we have a social media calendar that we created in our a Google document. Um, so we have access to this. We also have a communications consultant. So we all can kind of add in into here. And if you see that the tab that's up right there is just the, the date sheet. So it, it lists all our different posts by week for all the platforms. And then it also splits out on the other tabs to Facebook, Google Plus, and Twitter. Um, so if we're posting on Facebook, we'll go to the Facebook tab tab, grab the post, put the link in there, and it also keeps track of over on the right that's kind of cut off the partners that we're recognizing, so we can keep track of that as well. Um, however, our intern that created this and was managing it left a couple weeks ago, and we haven't touched it since, which is uh, one of our problems with uh, time management, I guess. Your problem. Yeah. <laughs> um, so these are the questions uh, that we had earlier. And before, I guess, we open it up to answers, I just want to share, I guess I'll leave it up on this page. This is our uh, the metrics that we currently track for social media. Um, and we grabbed this from another Big Brothers, Big Sisters agency we thought was doing it particularly well. Um, the orange means that we're not hitting the goals that we've set, and the blue means that we are. Um, so we're just not sure what other people are doing to track and if this is a good measure of, of success or if it's not. And, um, and candidly, we're sort of feeling our way around the goals too sometimes, you know, as, as, as we do. Is that okay? Good. Yes, okay, great. Okay, thanks. Sorry, I didn't mean to rush you, but as I said, no, try no, to no. keep. I am the timekeeper. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, um, and I just want you to know that I too have the challenge of money and men. So it's not. It's, it's not. <laughs> so so uh, anyway, so it's you know it's universal. It's you know it crosses many boundaries. So anyway, okay. So um, as you can see, I mean, there's quite a lot going on with the organization. There's a lot of different avenues that they can pull from in order to. Uh, to uh, publicize things that, that are happening on social media. So let's, all right, so here, here's the question. As I said, you know, these are just jumping off points. If anything that they have said or, you know, anything that you've heard, you know, gives you some sort of idea, any of the programs in particular that you think, hey, you know, this, this particular program, like it's too bad that Google Plus, you know, isn't working out. And I know that that's generally, you know, it sort of seems the way it is because it's primarily guys. <laughs> But uh, um, it's generally people that are sort of into the tech, you know, uh, world or 
skewing that way tech or people that are sort of in that in that realm. But anyway, um, so all right, I'm going to open up the floor and uh, I'm just going to go around and just, uh, I know it's not polite to point, but I'm going to have to do that. Yeah, okay, all right. Hi, I um, like the social media calendar. Did you say it was a Google Doc? Yes, it is a yeah. Google Doc. Anyone, anyone in particular? Is it? It's not your regular Google Calendar, is it? Oh, so we just—it's like a private Google Doc. So I just have it's a it. spreadsheet. Yeah. It's a Google it's spreadsheet. spreadsheet. Yeah. yeah. That's all. And we okay. created it in Google and not Excel because we share it with people. Our communications consultant can't access our internal documents. Okay. <laughs> we'll just I'll kind of go. Probably so. Um, for all these things, I guess the one thing that I'm not figuring out from your presentation is um, what are the communication goals that you're, so not just the metrics of likes, but what are the actual communication goals that you have that you're trying to achieve through the various social media platforms? So mostly through social media, we try to recruit volunteers. Um, I would say that, was, that would be the primary goal. Um, a secondary goal or goal number two has been to drive attendance to events. Um, although some of the goals have also been to drive, to increase social media followers, so let's create a group of people that are interested in what we're doing with the idea being that later down the road, we can ask them for money, drive them to an event, convince them to become a big brother, a big sister, those sorts of things. Um, general awareness, we have pretty good high brand recognition. So also volunteer or, uh, retention and recognition for our volunteers. Some of them don't know that we have, like you can go to the art museum for free if you contact us and we'll send you free tickets. So posting that on our Facebook where they've received the emails from their match support specialist, posting it again for them there so they can see and take advantage of that and feel, you know, oh cool, like I'm involved in this, I can get free tickets and, and be valued for, for volunteering. What, the two goals, the money and math? Yeah. At the end of the day. <laughs> So maybe I don't understand the world of um, family and youth uh, services, but um, why are you focusing only on volunteers and not on the the kids themselves, as mem as Facebook likers likes? <laughs> I mean, why not? Because I mean, I I don't remember. I I don't know what at what age kids start to have a Facebook account. Oh, you have to be thirteen, so you're already on the old, the older end. I mean, they're already. It's, it's a great yeah. question. I guess my only response would be people that want to hurt kids need access to kids. And Big Brothers Big Sisters provides a lot of access to kids. So that's why we have layers upon layers upon layers of child safety procedures. And it's also why we didn't begin to even tread into the social media waters until about 15 months ago. So, and, that, and that, very few Big Brothers Big Sister agencies across the country did until we sort of like started to get a better understanding. Now I would say most of them are there, but it's again focused on the adult end because we're just fearful if we start to bring the kids in, not that they might not already be liking us or following us or doing those sorts of things, but we just, we, 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 we move very cautiously. Um, uh, sorry, what you doing? Okay, all right. It's, we're good. And you're next. <laughs> My question is uh, quasi-net tech, but um, what uh, age group of big sisters and big brothers do the children, you know, the young people most relate to? Because I would think that past a certain age, they might not relate to them as well as, let's say, somebody in their 20s or 30s, somebody that would be more like their parent or their, friend, you know, an older brother. I'd love to generalize it for you. Um, however, we have folks in their 80s that are even more effective than 28-year-old mentors. The majority of our mentors are between the ages of, I would say, uh, 25 and 45. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, it's a huge college population, and they're not really involved. Um, but we have people that you know are 80 years old and. Um, it's, they're connecting in such a different way, so I, I wouldn't want to paint everyone with a broad brush. You have to be over 18, and that's that's about it. Really, you know, you pass the clearances, able to make the commitment, appropriate attitudes towards risk, things like that. Okay. 
Um, one of the questions you asked is how to increase engagement. Uh, in listening to the strategies that you're employing so far, um, a lot of these are push out rather than, than pull in. Um, I, with all of these opportunities for, for conversation, I don't, I don't hear that you're actively cultivating a lot of conversations. Um, so just following on to that, a couple of thoughts. Um, and these are, these are specifically conversations among your bigs. And there are a lot of ways that those can happen. Um, you, you raised the question about Google+. Plus. One possibility there is to create hangouts for your bigs, either geographically or cross-geographically, around certain issues. A hangout is a, is a live face-to-face -face conversation that you can do where everybody sees everybody else there. It's like sitting together in a room. Um, so that's one possibility there. Another thing specifically to engage the men that I think you're missing out on um, would be to add uh, yet another platform, which would be LinkedIn. Um, you could create a LinkedIn company page. Um, and there you, the first thing I would do there is to encourage all your existing corporate partners to get on there, uh, both corporately and through individuals in those things, and start conversations through LinkedIn. Um, because what you've got there is access to the guys you're looking for through all the, all the, uh, the corporate participation. LinkedIn's more male use user. Well, I don't, I don't know that that demographic is true, but I know it's very, it's extremely corporate and professionally oriented. Yeah, I, like we can, I can show you later, or they, they can show you how it works. Was that your third one, or is that you have one more, or is that it? That, that's it. Yes. Okay, all right, over there. We'll get back to it. Um, I agree that LinkedIn would probably be an awesome place to go to build corporate support. Uh, I think that corporate companies that have money, when they see that Sigma, or Sigma, whatever it was, and Comcast are all on board and that the Comcast one actually spread out. You'll get other corporations that want to join. Uh, so I, I think definitely LinkedIn. The other thing that we've talked about in this group is digital storytelling, is to get some of these men to tell a story. And there was a guy who said you need a video camera and a room with no windows because you don't want to hear the trucks and the buses. And you just have that man tell their story for three minutes about what it has meant. And you said, you know, already people at Sigma were saying that. You post that on Facebook, you post it on LinkedIn, you post it wherever. And um, I think you'd be golden. The other thing, um, the question about how much, and we've talked about that, how often, uh, I think they've talked about setting it aside 10 minutes a day, uh, 10 minutes an hour, just to go check your um, your uh, social media places just to see what's going on. Uh, there's one called Hootsuite that's very user-friendly. You can keep that running in the background. Right, right, yeah. Yeah, and then um, personally your Facebook page is a little boring. I think you need to, j I'm sorry, it just needs to jazz up. Oh. <laughs> So that's a, it's a step up. Can we? Um, yeah. Um, I just want to piggyback on that, and then we'll get to you um, about the digital storytelling. But I don't. I don't know because I guess. Um, it sounds like you may be reluctant to be featuring the uh, the littles in the videos in the public. I don't know if no, you are. Yeah, we, yeah. And we have some but videos and we, we're yeah, interested in doing more. It's more. It's more like the fear of if we have kids that are involved. Is there any way? And maybe there is, but that some stranger befriends that child on through our Facebook page and then tries to develop a relationship. You know, that's what we're, our fear, uh, fear is. Yeah, um, yeah. I. I guess you'll just have to figure out, you know, kind of what, what the line is there. But, um, you know, when a big and a little are doing something and you see them together, I think it's good, you know, if you have them pop separately. But when people see, like, the closeness, because I remember I went to your breakfast, and when you hear the, per the, little, the little 
tell their story about how much it meant. They're big, right? And then you have the big that's there with the little, and then they showed them together, and they were like doing things. I mean, it's very similar, but but that the um, that you know you could just have something where you encourage them, you know, like do like my the day, you know, my the, a day, like wherever they go, like they go out, right? They go to the baseball game, they go to this, they go to that. Um, the majority of people have cell phones, so it doesn't, I mean, especially in this, right, you could even give them a flip band, but I mean, a lot of people have the cell phones, people, especially on Facebook, they're used to seeing, you know, their friends showing their kid or whatever. It doesn't have to be long and just kind of encouraging that kind of thing where they could just say like, hey, you know, when you're out on your next whatever thing that you do, um, if you think it's interesting, you know, why not share it? And they even just you know, encourage that and then have, but to have them together, because as I said, you know, I think that that connection, not that the other, one or the other isn't bad, but when you see that, people can kind of feel like what both people are getting out of it, because they want to be able to see that the big is kind of how good they feel, but also that the person who's doing it, and when they're, t you know, you, you, you get more of that rather than just sort of talking about it, they'll just see it. Anyway, so, all right, um, the next one was over on this side, okay, there you go. Have you, um, what have your volunteers said about the Facebook page? Have they given you content? Have they, do you have a group that maybe wants to take that and work it? And so that it's not just a staff thing? I love that idea. But I think the answer is no, I don't know that we have done that. I mean, because here's the team, right? I mean, <laughs> the reality is, is that I'm yeah. not much of a team member. Um, it's all this. So uh, it's an interesting idea, especially some of the volunteers who are adept at it. Um, we don't have a lot of rules, right, that they need to follow, and they might be able to help us. That's a great idea. <coughs> All right, two minutes, so go ahead. Uh, right, just we'll go down the line. Um, for the uh, metrics, are, are you using, Facebook has a analytics tool, I believe. Do you use that or do you, yeah, okay. So we grabbed some of the metrics off of that. Um, we don't look at all of them probably as closely yeah. as we should. Um, I think we measure, I'm just gonna go back to our page. Likes, the posts that we make, we keep track of, uh, quarterly likes, comments, and shares on our posts. Um, and my, page. Oh, sorry. Uh, the other question I had was uh, with, Universities and colleges, you're you're recruiting there. I my daughter just told me that she's at James Madison University, and you guys were there. Um, do you do you, how, how do you tar do you target at all? I mean, do you go to like education departments or? Well, on college campuses, it's actually been largely student led, which is why mm -hmm. I think you're onto something here with the volunteers. So the, there's a Penn student. Big Brothers Big Sisters Association. Okay. In fact, it's one of the largest student-run organizations on campus. They do everything for us. They mm -hmm. recruit. They have informational sessions. I mean, we're there and we do different things, but like they lead it. Mm -hmm. um, there's a similar one at Temple, um, and uh, and I think some of the other colleges. So, so they it doesn't matter to us if you're an education major or a nursing major. Mm -hmm. um, it's more, are you willing, you know, to, to, to spend this time with a child? Are you going to be consistent? Do you, do you have appropriate attitudes towards risk and, and things like that? Um, so I would just think, you know, that kids that are in, going into education or social work would probably be more inclined to do something yeah, like this. I so, think we do, yeah. you know, follow that. And the other thought I had was sororities and fraternities. I don't know if yeah, uh, have, you're focusing we have, on we, we tend to do better with the alumni chapters than the active chapters. Uh, um, okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, we'll do you, and I know Andrew had one that he was kind of there, and then, and then so it'll be those two, and then we're going to move on to the next one. So, I'm just going to really quickly run through several comments. Uh, for metrics you should be tracking, you should definitely be tracking referrals from your social media to your website to see what kind of traffic you're generating, even if you're not getting direct engagement, that's probably important. Also, donations that you're getting in some way, if you're getting a link from Twitter to your page and getting a donation, you probably want to know about that. As far as maximizing your efficiency, you should be scheduling tweets and scheduling retweets later on and things like that. And I'd be following way more people. I noticed you were only following like 500. Just look what other people are doing and follow hundreds and hundreds of people. Um, in addition, um, 
I would suggest for recruitment, especially of men, to focus on the wealth of amazing technology stuff going on in Philly, the open data movement, the open government movement. There are technology meetups that are hacker kind of events all the time. They're almost all men, and those people could bring the littles to those events. It serves kind of multiple purposes. And I'd also try to work with some sort of well-known yet well-respected people in the community that talk more to kids like, Quest love from the roots and the whole event that happened here. So I would try to kind of play on a younger, uh, more technology focused demographic and just want to um, echo what the other gentleman was saying about Google Plus. No one uses Google Plus for anything except for that chat function. So you can engage in that particular way and that might be useful. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So we're going to do Andrew. I just going to, so, and again, as I said, um, not to take a person. Yeah. Oh. oh. All right. Okay. All right. I'll be fast. Okay. So, um, all right, here we go. So the big thing that I was coming up with is that it's a little different than the volunteers. Have the bigs themselves be the ones that are posting on your Facebook page. When I saw your Facebook page, all I saw was your logo and your logo and your logo and also very few images. So you could also be leveraging the social networks of the companies that you're working with, i.e. getting them to post on your page or cross-posting or with, especially within tweets so that they're going to want to brag to high heaven about the work they're doing with you, get them bragging. Get them bragging on your page and others. Um, so with the worries about safety for the littles, do you guys have a social media policy at all? All right. So you might want to make sure that you make a very simple version of that for the bigs themselves, just to give them a couple guidelines on how to keep their little safe. And then it might take everything away. Like it could be as simple as no last names. That's it. Pictures, first names, it's fine. So... Um, so that way you can have them get in there and get away from the organizational news, go to the digital storytelling, get lots and lots of stories there. On YouTube, your views are very low for having that many videos. So are you sharing from YouTube? Because YouTube has the best analytics and insights going for video. So you want to make sure that every video that you're putting up there, you don't want to re-upload it to Facebook or re-upload it anywhere else. You want to upload once to YouTube. That's your link to share, be that on Twitter, Facebook, and, of course, not Google+. <laughs> um, almost done. So uh, there's, you could do a lot of things with either gamifications or contests to try to drive volunteerism in terms of having some of those companies. You could ha pit them against each other. Let them compete. So, for instance, a photo contest where you ask the bigs to put up pictures with their littles. Uh, we've heard mentions of ball games like six times tonight. As far as I'm concerned, all people do is go to Phillies games. Where you know, Put up a contest. What's your favorite place to take your little? Have people post about that. So then you're asking for responses and you get that two-way engagement that someone else was referring to. Um, the gamification stuff, like if you look at Foursquare, you could use some location-based stuff. Like you could ask your bigs to check in at places and check in that I'm, he yeah, I'm here with my little. I'm out for Big Brothers, Big Sisters, Southeastern PA today at the Phillies game. So uh, as the team goes down, that's it. Donations go up. It's an inverse relationship. But the, the so the main point though is really to get away from you guys. Have, it's not. I mean, you're going to need to continue to post for the fundraising. That's got to come from you. But if you had like twice as many posts from your bigs with all you know a lot of these different things and getting them to really interact with each other on your page, then it's then your posts get lost among photos, their videos, stuff off their cell phones. Your work gets easier, your engagement gets higher. Right. Okay, Andrew will be the last one. And then we'll, we'll move on. But this is great. We have so many good suggestions. And again, afterwards, you know, we'll have time for you to speak individually. All right, I have a, a suggestion from Twitter. Uh, speaking of baseball games, uh, someone from Twitter suggested that you form a partnership of sorts with uh, local Philly bloggers um, who specifically blog about sports events to perhaps uh, – perhaps as a strategy to attract more big brothers. I, I'm kind of extrapolating that a great idea might be to um, actually have them post something specifically about someone's experience at, you know, a ball game with their, their little or something like that. Uh, to follow up on the Twitter thing, following more people on Twitter, if you guys have a CRM system or something where you track volunteer engagement, you have a lot of email addresses. Import those email addresses. You're, you guys are on Google Apps. Import them into the account that you guys use to register your Twitter 
um, you handle with and say Im import friends from my, my address book, find friends in my address book. And anybody who registered um, on Twitter with the email address that they gave you is instantly going to be someone that you're going to start following on Twitter. So you started following people who have already participated in Big Brother, um, Big Sister events, which is, I think, a, a great pool of, of potential people. Right. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, all right, uh, and don't forget the power of the retweet for your for your for your group too, because that's that's always a good thing. But anyway, all right. So, right, okay. All right, good. Okay. All right. So um, this is great. It's always good to have. You know, this is what they call the uh, the good problem to have. To have so many suggestions that we have to cut it a little short, and then afterwards, you know, you're welcome to uh, carry on the conversation. Okay. Next up is the Lupus Foundation and Annette. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's great to be here. I know the question was asked before, the two questions together, how many people have heard of lupus and do you know what it is? And I'm not sure if you answered both questions at once or you were really thinking about how many have, I think everyone here has heard of lupus. Certainly if you've ever watched an episode of House, um, The Shield and other television shows, even Seinfeld has a lupus uh, Play. John Stewart had something about lupus. It's a word that gets thrown out a lot, so most people do know what it is, uh, have heard of it, but don't necessarily know what it is. I'm just curious how many people in the room know what lupus is. Okay, lots of you. That's great. Oh. Okay, well, I'm going to just talk, give a few um, pieces of information about lupus. Um, I just want to tell you a little bit about our organization. As, as was mentioned earlier, we are part of the Lupus Foundation of America. We're an affiliate chapter. I was recruited to the organization almost 11 years ago, and it was at a time when there were two lupus groups in the Philadelphia market that merged, Delaware Valley and Philadelphia chapters. Totally uh, grassroots run, uh, half-time paid staff, um, they didn't use the U.S. mail system. They drove things to people's houses. Every pencil, paper clip was donated. It really, truly grassroots um, endeavor. So in the 10 plus years that I've been here, we've really been professionalizing the organization, putting symptom, systems into place um, to, to give us the tools that we need to try to grow. Um, but with all of that being said, we are still a relatively small organization. Uh, we have exceeded $600,000 this fiscal year. We're probably going to make our budgeted goal. And hopefully next year, 2013, we'll climb to 750. But in the Philadelphia market, that is, that's, that's a small organization. And we've existed since the early 70s. So um, while we have a very strong um, history, uh, rich history, you know, providing services to the community, we're still like an infant in terms of the sophistication of, of our systems. And I'm, I'm, I'm proud of where we've, we've come in the last decade. Um, lupus is a chronic autoimmune disease. We all have an immune system. It protects us from things like bacteria and viruses and infections. When someone gets lupus, the immune system has an imbalance. The body's making antibodies, but it can't distinguish between the foreign invader, like a virus or a bacteria, and the self. And so those antibodies build up in the system that results in inflammation. That inflammation can damage or destroy any part of the body, any organ or system of the body, the heart, lungs, brains, kidneys, skin, joints, blood, any cell in the body is really a potential target. It's multi-system, so any, again, organ or system in the body can be affected, and it's often referred to as under a rheumatic disease or under the rheumatic disease umbrella. So rheumatology is the principal specialty in terms of managing lupus. It's estimated that there's 1.5 to 2 million Americans living with lupus. There are different kinds of lupus. I won't go into all of that. And based on the incidence rates or prevalence rates that we know from CDC, which are out of date, but thankfully we'll be getting some new reports soon due to our work on the Hill in terms of funding some epidemiology studies. We anticipate there are as more than 40,000 people in the Philadelphia tri-state region. So that's southeastern PA, southern Jersey, and Delaware. 90% of lupus cases are women. Most of those women, 80% of those women are in their childbearing years, between 15 and 45 years of age. And lupus does affect women of color more often than Caucasian populations. So we know that there are th these three things that come into play in terms of causing lupus. Genetics, for sure, when we see total populations that are affected more often. We know there's some sort of hormonal connection by the basis of 
90% of the cases being women and the majority of those women being in their childbearing years where the hormones are fluctuating. We also know there's environmental triggers. The sun is a, a pretty common environmental trigger for people with lupus. Being in the sun can cause a flare-up. And of course, the level of severity of that can vary from person to person. The virus can be a trigger, stress can be a trigger, and so forth. Now, the interesting thing about lupus is it's extremely heterogeneous. It's, um, people with lupus are like snowflakes. No two cases are alike. So you really can't predict any set prognosis. The disease can range from mild to moderate to life-threatening, and people living with lupus can move back and forth on that continuum without any predictability. Um, and it's a disease that flares up and also can go into remission. So kind of planning your life around a disease that could be mild, moderate, or life-threatening, can come and go with no predictability, is certainly a challenge to live with. And I also think that is what the, it presents the challenge in terms of, well, how do I share with others that I have lupus? Do I really want people to know this, or do I really want my, my employer to know, oh, I have an unpredictable, possibly life-threatening disease? It's, it's, it's a huge challenge. Um, in terms of the work that our organization does, information and referral, public awareness and outreach activity, activities, uh, by being seen in the community. If we're invited to a community event, we go to the community event. We know that you know, we don't wanna just say we serve the community, we really do our best to spread our resources to physically be there. And of course, now we really know that it's important to be seen via these social media tools. And we've, we've gone down the lane um, and really want to learn how to maximize these opportunities. I've already gotten a lot of nuggets, so I'm thrilled with um, coming out this evening and appreciate everybody's um, information. We do public and professional education programs, whether they're CME certified or nursing credits for the medical community or public forums, might maybe around social security disability or um, coping with stress and lupus, medications, et cetera. Advocacy, of course, is at the forefront because we know that the greatest likelihood of finding a cure for lupus is going to come from a federally funded project. The National Institutes of Health um, are where the big dollars are spent. It's the leading source of funding in addition to the private sector, um, which is another area where we're always working to remove barriers. Um, I don't know if anyone recalls the press last year, was it last year, 20, that was last March, uh, the first drug ever developed for lupus was approved last year. There are seven FDA, besides this new one, seven FDA approved drugs for lupus that weren't developed for lupus. They were developed for other diseases and borrowed. So many of the treatments that people are getting for lupus are off-label. So as an organization, we're trying to identify, well, why is industry not looking at lupus? Is it they don't see a market? Is it because of the complexity of the disease? Is it the FDA guidelines? And try to, where can we remove a barrier if that's possible? Um, the advocacy and the social media, to me, are, are the very integrated, because when we really need to move on something, we wanna be able to have that army of people to, um, to call upon, and that's where we, we really need help in terms of growing, because people are reluctant, they're reluctant to be part of that loud voice. We provide support groups, we do peer counseling, we have a self-help course that's a standardized program. Our annual um, signature event, Living Well with Lupus, is coming up in early October. Uh, we have a newsletter, we do an e-newsletter. Our national magazine is Lupus Now, it's a wonderful publication. We do provide some direct financial assistance and of course, uh, lots of volunteer opportunities. And we, we, we are a pretty small army. Um, our staff is 5.5 full-time full equivalents, trying to reach 40,000 plus people. Uh, so we all do everything. <laughs> I said, oh, tech, not tech people are here. This is great. I don't have to figure out how to plug this in and how to work that because I'm usually the one doing it and I am not a technology person. We have, of the people that are, you know, we anticipate our, our constituencies, 40,000, we have maybe a thousand dues-paying members, so we're clearly not reaching our market. Um, I talk to people with lupus every day. Every person in our office answers the phones, provides health counseling. It's very interesting. Nine out of ten callers have gone to three or four doctors before they get to that diagnosis. Once they're diagnosed, they realize they've been living with this disease for many years 
or if that's if they're newly diagnosed. If they've been diagnosed, it's very interesting. People do not contact us five years, 10 years, and sometimes it's after the person has passed away that the family members finally reach out to me. There is this barrier that exists with lupus, and I don't know how to erase it. Like the person that connected Denny to myself is a member of our board. I happened to be in the office late one night. I answered the phone. She was calling for information. I think I'd like to join. I'm interested in volunteering. She's telling me her name. I'm Googling her. I can see she's a top 40, uh, uh, under 40 in the Latino community. Right away, my radar is going off. And I said, how long ago were you diagnosed with lupus? Seven years, 10 years. It was a long time. Have you called before? No, this is my first time. I said, if you don't mind my asking, what took you so long? Why? And she said, I was ashamed. So people living with this disease, maybe because we're not getting enough public awareness, don't feel empowered to share their story. Um, and it, it's a continuous challenge and I see this all the time. The other interesting thing is I will talk to many people and we'll have a fantastic call. I can hear that they've had several light bulb moments about um, strategies to live better, feeling a connection to, to a community that understands what they're going through. And at the end of the call, they'll say, oh, well, how long have you had lupus? And I say, well, I don't have lupus. And I could hear the credibility kind of come out of the end of that call. So it's a very interesting thing in terms of the people we're trying to serve and what my observations are in terms of some of our, our roadblocks. So those are folks you spend time with, you invest, you invite them to the upcoming program, and then they don't come. There's that reluctance to make that connection, whether it's lupus is a full-time job as it is, therefore I don't want to do anything additional. I, I don't really know, but it's, it's really a challenge for us, and I certainly see that perhaps with the use of social media might, might help some of that. Now, all of that being said, our um, largest event of the year is the Lupus Loop. It's a 5K run and a two and a half mile walk. It's coming up in October. This drives more than half of our annual income. Um, so it's a very important event. Our fiscal year starts October 1. It basically sets the bar for the rest of the year. And so we really want to think about, and we don't have any teased out strategies for uh, how can we use social media to, to drive us to our goals. So our financial goal is $400,000, 4,000 participants, and 400 teams. Now, last year's event happened at the end of October, the day of the Nor'easter. Thank you very much. We had 3,300 people. Actually, we probably ended up about 3,700 people that made it despite the weather. So I think the 4,000 as a goal is quite reasonable. We raised $308,000 and we had 315 teams. So I think our, our growth is, is reasonable. The interesting thing about the walk is this is the place where the people with lupus jump on board. Um, it's not the programs, the direct services. I'm not quite sure why, maybe because you're part of this larger community. And so that is what interest people. Maybe you can be more anonymous in a larger crowd. Um, so we want to try to maximize the capability because we recognize it's going to come from this event. And then how do we try to cultivate those folks or the followers, etc. So we have a Facebook page and I, I didn't take a snapshot of it. I don't know if I need to pull it up here if I want to show it. Our, I would say our Facebook page is probably boring. <laughs> um, we don't, um, we tend to come in waves in terms of how we post because we're such a small staff. Our um, community development manager, who I would have brought with me tonight, but she's in her ninth month of pregnancy, and she really didn't want to come out at night, um, it really manages the, the majority of posts. Um, and so with her going on maternity leave in the next couple of weeks, it's going to fall on my lap on top of, of everything else. So. Um, blog, I heard the word blogger. I'm like, oh, oh, it gets a little overwhelming in terms of all of the potential opportunities. So maybe some strategies or some, some insight from you all in terms of where to focus best on efforts. We uh, did an event, May is Lupus Awareness Month, and we were out in Love Park having our World Lupus Day Rally. And our national office, um, the campaign this year was put on purple. Purple is our awareness color because everybody has a color. And of course, we really have a lot of competition from the pink world. 
So we're trying to ride that momentum as best we can. And we did create a put on purple event on our Facebook page. And we had over 2,000 people pledge to put on purple. Alzheimer's, purple, violent, uh, domestic violence. There's only so many colors in the rainbow, right, right, and it's okay right. for us to share. Um, so that was a wonderful um, response, but it, then it, the question is, now what? what? What do we do with these folks in terms of engaging them? Of course, they're not necessarily from our geographic service territory. Uh, it's kind of a, just a big can of worms that um, I've opened. Okay, all right. Uh, I don't know if you, I mean, I can take the questions if you want. You can, if you want to go on your site, I mean, because you'd be able to get to your sites from there. So uh, let's take a look at the questions here and who, okay, right there. Let's go there. Um, I just wanted to know how much uh, do you use your Facebook page to engage your followers to talk about lupus? that if you lose your credibility by you ending the conversation saying, yeah, I don't have it, how do you encourage the people who do have it to talk on your Facebook page? We will post questions sometimes. Um, with the Put on Purple campaign, we ask people to post their pictures of putting on purple. We try to contest. Um, so staff, staff basically put the, uh, we posted some of our own pictures to kind of get some momentum going. And we, we got the most likes. That wasn't what we were hoping for. We were hoping for the community folks to get the most. We have a few people who will share some information about lupus, but I think people are reluctant to put their face on there and write about what their experience. And I, you know, with our support group program, our attendance is really low. And people tell me they're fearful to go because they don't want to see what could happen to them. They are afraid that I'm going to see the worst case scenario, and that's not what I want. So I, I think we have to think about our messaging from, excuse me, from that empowerment standpoint. It's it's very it's very interesting. Okay, so we have a few people. We have 878 likes, I believe, right now on our Facebook page. Far less on Twitter. We don't tweet as much as we post on Facebook. Uh, we definitely don't follow enough people, so that that was a good strategy. And when you say follow everybody, I don't like I, perhaps um, on Twitter. Um, I think there's a lot of things that we could do to just try to beef up those numbers. Okay, Seth, you have a. Yeah, I, I'm wondering if you do anything with the um, forums for people with lupus. There are a number of online forums of people with lupus who are sharing information and stories with one another. Um, and maybe on your website or something you can make this a little more available and promote it, but basically helping people who have the disease to connect with one another or the families without having to look at each other face to face. I mean, without having to come into, into proximity, which, which they might feel more, um, intimidated from doing, doing so online really, um, provides an extra avenue for them. Yeah, we haven't done anything with the forum. So that's a, quite a few of a them. Good, I just looked. I have, I've looked at some of them. And then again, I think I get overwhelmed just trying to figure out what, and I don't, is there any, is it really just, I guess, maybe making the list available? How, how would you suggest? Well, I, think, I just looked at the lupus forums on, on Google. There were several, and you could probably, with a little bit of web help, get some stuff so that you're, you're on your website itself. It displays recent posts and stuff like that, invites people to get involved. Maybe one or more of those forums. I don't know what, you know, anything about them. Okay. Thank you. That's a good suggestion. Hi. Um, yeah, on the, on the Lupus Foundation of America main website, there, there used to be, like, a, I have lupus, and um, uh, it, there used to be, like, a, a whole series of, of, like, a blog role and different forums. Yeah, on the national and, website. So um, they have their own blog right. and um, connect to other blogs. And the national site does far better than we do. So that's another challenge that we have in terms of actually – Right, like, are you competing? Well, and, and I guess, I guess I've always thought that, um, uh, and I think this is true of any chronic illness, that, um, social media is a, is a wonderful way to connect people that are, are suffering from the, from an illness because, um, you know, if sometimes they can't, you know, get out of bed or whatever, they can be on their computer and sharing stories and, and sharing relevant details. So I, I, I've often thought that having some kind of, uh, again, digital storytelling, like, um, 
having people do video testimonials about their experience, like a day in the life of somebody with lupus. Um, and also using your, your site and, and your social media avenues to direct people to each other and also to um, relevant resources like, uh, you know, m different medical resources, different um, uh, community resources um, th that they can actually use that, that maybe uh, takes away a little bit of the stigma. Um, and I know that there was like a larger campaign again for the national. So I, I think that must be one of your challenges is, is, to, is to try to figure out how, how to differentiate yourself. We're, we're each chapter, because we are a very grassroots organization, we must, we, the, the chapters built the national organization. Right. Um, so everyone is separately incorporated. Everyone holds a separate 501c3 determination. Um, but if you Google lupus, you get lupus.org. Right. You don't get lupustristate.org. Right. So they don't share contacts back with us unless the person gives permission. So um, unfortunately, the, that stream and, you know, to the public, we're all, we're all one. Right. There are actually four other lupus groups that are not Lupus Foundation of America. And that also creates some confusion in terms of, well, aren't you all one organization? So. Okay. Yep, we can just pass it down. Just a quick follow-up question to that: um, Does the does the national organization proactively go out to somebody, to, to people who contact them, and say, "Would you like to be put in touch with the local organization?" I, if you're if you're on the website and you fill out the contact form, that's automatically entered. Or if you're on the home page, it'll say, "Find your chapter." So it's there, um, and we do get some referrals in that way. But, um, but not all the time, certainly not every contact. And we'll get national to blog if we have an event coming up or something we try to get them to promote it. They do have a, a central walk website for all the walks happening around the country and, and we're listed there like every other chapter that's hosting a walk. Hi, so I'll try to keep it brief. I would love to talk to you afterwards. Like I said, I'm on the board of, of the National Alliance of Mental Illness San Francisco so many similarities. Uh, they're national, state, and local, grassroots organization, lots of the same challenges, but I think maybe some insights. So stigma busting is not noted as one of your goals. If it's one of your goals, you should note it so that people know that. You should talk about it, and you should be proactive. NAMI has a great program called In Our Own Voice, where people who have mental illness go into corporate settings, go into nursing school settings, and it not only serves stigma busting, but quite frankly, it often uh, generates both donations and volunteer opportunities. We also focus a lot of our message on wellness, recovery, and hope, and that, that can change things a lot. We do outreach in doctor's offices and ask for referrals and that also causes a lot of uh, in, inbound calls. Um, and um, I would also maybe just uh, pressure your national organization to change. Uh, our national organization is required to give us a portion of the, the, the fee that they get if anyone joins and they're in our location as well as information and all kinds of, of other things. So I think those things could, could really help you. And, I'll be brief, but if you, we'll love to connect afterwards if you want to talk more. Okay, her, and then I saw you had raised your hand, so we'll swing it around. So, so the suggestion I had that came to mind was uh, it had some similar, similarities with what you just said, and that is that maybe your um, the focus of your public Facebook page is this idea of education and uh, like what you said about the stigma busting, but that you could create a separate a private Facebook page. I know our organization has used a private Facebook page for a closed group of like a child, uh, a youth pilgrimage, a youth uh, youth travel, and maybe that's where you could direct the people who are looking for a uh, private private conversation, not open to the public. I didn't know you could do that. Uh, yeah, you raise your hand, right? Yes. Um, other people have said much of what I was thinking, but one of the things is thinking, who are some spokespeople who can help you to, so it's not just you and staff, and it's not just people who live, but there are people who are standing up. Um, one of the really good campaigns um, is actually has a mental health campaign with Glenn Close and her sister. So who are some spokespeople um, who stand up? Our national office has gotten a few. Uh, uh, Julian Lennon has been a spokesperson. He was able to get some national press. We have no access to these folks, though, as a local chapter. Uh, on a local level, we have had uh, Sheldon Brown from the Philadelphia. This, I'm like the kiss of death. I, we get someone from a local team, and then they get traded. Uh -oh. He's now in Cleveland. Uh, and we, we've tried, and we've been, we've, we've 
um, learned about other, um, not any celebrities on a local level, but some corporate folks. And when we've approached them, they, people have said to me, I don't have lupus. I don't know who told you that. That there is a the, the denial or the that that's a it's a real layer that we have to try to break through. Pardon me? No, they don't have to have it. And that's the thing is how do we get the people to, how do we get the people who don't have lupus to care about it? Because it's not a disease that you can see. You look perfectly fine. Um, oh, that's why you look familiar. The um, every time we have someone do radio or TV. The, the the thing that the the person with lupus tends to talk about most most is the the joint pain and the the very debilitating fatigue. Now that usually indicates that they have some other more serious complication going on, but that isn't what they're talking about because the kidney failure isn't what's affecting their daily life. It's trying to get out of bed. It's trying to get dressed. It's trying to get to work. So there's that disconnect to the rest of the people who are two or three degrees separated from that person with lupus. Okay, uh, she, you'd raise, wait, uh, I'm trying. You, actually, you, uh, you already, one more uh, yep. tell your story. Maybe along those lines, um, you know, looking at a, since it's a female disease primary, 90%, you know, my mom has lupus, right? That kind of, you know, that kind of a meme, right. if you could put that out there, that might be very effective. Also, um, getting back to the lupus loop, um, have you targeted female run businesses in the area? There are a lot of groups and you can look on LinkedIn. We talk yeah, about we, we've tried time. some outreach, um, again, because of our limited resources, we don't spend as much time. Maybe we could get more volunteers to help in that endeavor and be focused on it writing to some uh, women-owned businesses and really looking for that champion. Um, haven't haven't made the connection yet, but we're still trying to pursue. And certainly minority-run businesses as well because of the demographics of the disease. Okay, we're going to do one more, and then I know other people here, there's more to come, and then we'll share afterwards. And I think some of the things will actually overlap, at least, because you've got also an event that's similar, too. So one one more, and then we'll – who's – was that – we're going to – go I, I know it's not always um, – people don't engage in it when you use the avatars on on um, websites, but there may be a way to – it's going along with the privacy piece. If people create an a a avatar and then they can kind of talk, they don't know who they are, you know, but um, at least it gives them the form to talk and then communicate with different people without, mm -hmm. identi you know, their identity being disclosed. Okay. Uh, thanks, everybody. Another good round of suggestions. And as I said, hang out afterwards and you know, share some more. But uh, we have our final presenter, which is Stephanie from the AIDS Fund. So uh, while we're waiting for Stephanie, how many people now really did know what lupus was after it was explained? <laughs> Can I start? Yeah, go right ahead. Hi, everyone. My name is Stephanie, and I'm from AIDS Fund. I am the voice behind all our social media platforms. <laughs> so if you post anything and someone replies you, that's me. <laughs> Um, okay, so I'm going to start really brief. I'm just going to go briefly through what we do and because I want to focus more on our social media platform. Um, so like Denny shared, we support HIV AIDS education prevention services in the Delaware Valley region by raising dollars. And we currently support 30 organizations through these, the following events. Our biggest one being um, the AIDS Walk Run Philly. This is the largest annual HIV AIDS awareness and fundraising event in the Delaware Valley. Um, it's a 12K walk and a 5K run. And this year it's going to be on October 21st and it's our 26th year. Um, Gay Bingo is another one of our um, events. This year would be our 17th season and so far we have raised, I wanna say $2 million for HIV AIDS. 
And this is a picture of our bingo verifying divas. Um, gay bingo would not be what it is without them. So, um, um, Third event is our black tie gay bingo, which is just a more formal version of a gay bingo. Um, we're also very involved in World AIDS Day. Um, it's on de December 1st, and we have a quote cool display. Um, and we partner with other organizations to do this. Um, we're also involved in workplace giving campaigns with Drexel, um, UPenn, and the City of Philadelphia combined campaign. Sorry, I'm like skipping through these. Um, we also have um, panels from the AIDS and Merrill Quilt from the, the Names Project, and um, community members will invite us out to events and um, we'll have them on display. We also have a timeline, which we call 1981 until it's over. Um, again, we get invited out to camp to events and we bring it and it's like, it takes, I, I want to say 30 minutes to set it up and it's all handmade. Like we made these signs, we painted them. <laughs> um, and last but not least is our public awareness campaigns. Um, we have posters, bus shelters, coffee sleeves, which are, I forgot to bring them, um, with the three statistics that we try to focus on in educating the public. Um, the first one being one in five infect, infected with HIV don't know it. Um, every nine and a half minutes, someone in the US is infected. And Philly's HIV infection rate is five times the national average. Um, so we try to use these three, we focus on these three statistics to kind of, we don't want to clutter it with too much statistics, and these are the three that we've been focusing on last year and this year. Um, oh, and we also have a toy drive for children who are infected or affected by HIV, and we do this around Christmas time. Um, and um, the donations go to, I want to say, Mazzoni. So, sorry, I've only been with AIDS Fund for two months, so. <laughs> I'm not making this up, I promise. So on to our social media strategy. Um, we really want to focus on the AIDS walk today, but I just want to touch on what we do for Gay Bingo. This is just a short little description of what Gay Bingo is. Um, so we have a Facebook page, and we have about um, a little bit over 2,000 followers, and we mainly focus on selling tickets and putting up pictures. Um, we have a bunch of great pictures of the event because it's a lot of fun. Um, it's very colorful. And so that's what we primarily do. We don't really track anything. Um, we just try to stay engaged with our audience. And we also started a Twitter, and we don't really have that many followers yet. So, um, But for AIDS Walk Run Philly, since our event is in October 21st, we're much more focused on this. Um, we have, so this is really exciting. We have our new website up, and as you can see um, on every single page on the right, there's our social media. And so we hope that, you know, when we link people back to the website, we can link them towards our other social media platforms as well. Um, and so I'm going to talk about what our goals are, different platforms are we're in, the different audiences that we're targeting, and then our different strategies, and then um, the questions. Am I going too fast? No, oh, you're good. All right, so our goals. Um, we have three primary goals. The first one is to increase public awareness of HIV and AIDS, and that's through education and um, using our stats. The second is to establish and maintain our relationship with our walkers, runners, volunteers, who are part of our online community. Um, and then the third is to motivate our walkers, runners, and volunteers to help spread the word and also fundraise through their networks using social media. Um, so this is our Facebook. Um, we have about 3,500 followers. Um, our audience is really wide. We are talking to walkers, we're talking to runners. We're talking to people who want to sponsor these walkers. Um, we're also talking to people who are leading groups of walkers. And so it's a very wide range of audiences. And so our posts are very are varied. Um, we try to keep it interesting. We, we try to not repeat 
um, post too much. And so we try to switch up the subject. Um, and we use a lot of um, statistics because, again, we really want to push that public awareness um, and through education. Um, and with our Twitter, we have a little bit over 700 followers. Um, we've started to follow more people. I went in and I went crazy and followed all our partner organizations, all sponsors, and anyone who we had even a little bit connection with. <laughs> um, and we love retweeting things. We love having conversations with people who are tweeting to us or even tweeting just about us. And we'll say a little thank you or we'll will say, wow, we really love your post. Can we reuse it kind of thing? And so that's, I feel like we do more Twitter posts than Facebook because they're very little and they get lost in, you know, the feeds. And so I want to keep, you know, posting things. Um, third, we have a YouTube channel. We only have four videos up. Um, we're getting, we're trying to get more views because these are very educational and very inspirational. Um, but there are, I think each video varies to be around like five or six minutes long. I don't know the attention span of our audiences, but we try to, you know, repost these on our Facebook. Hey, check out our video that we did. Um, and partner organizations love it because they are featured in the videos and they will share it and everything. So, um, the last platform that we are in, which we started, I want to say two weeks ago is Tumblr. Um, I've, I really pushed for this because it seems it's a it's a it's a blog and it's very informal um, and we can do a lot more posts that are you know related to articles or you know fundraising tips for our team captains so they're more informal than what our Facebook would be oh and I forgot to mention for our Facebook we do a lot of um, current events on local and national news um, so we link to articles. Um, we do, um, sorry, we do HIV statistics again, and we try to post about upcoming events that we are attending. Um, so the strategies. We, too, have a calendar, and it's this huge Excel spreadsheet. Um, we do a lot of scheduled posts because we do want to schedule it around what's happening, um, you know, in in the HIV AIDS news world, and we do want to schedule it around stuff that we are involved in ourselves. Um, and so it becomes a little hectic because a lot of things, you know, it will be a random article that comes out, you know, on a Monday, and we'll have to kind of shift things around. But we use that Excel spreadsheet to keep track of what we have posted already, what we want to still post, and, you know, the minor things, how many people commented on this post, how many people liked it, how many people shared it, that kind of thing. Um, and so for in terms of engaging our audiences, we started a hashtag why I walk campaign. And what we've done so far is um, we started it off kind of gentle. We said, oh, here's, you know, a stat, um, and this is why we walk. Share with us. And we didn't really get any responses. And so we, so I took a picture of um, one of our staff members with hashtag why walk, and he wrote in honor of my friend who is living with HIV. And we were kind of like, okay, let's see where this is, this, this could go, because it's more visual, and hopefully somebody will not skip over it in their timeline. And um, we, we were so happy when Brianna <laughs> responded. Um, we went a little bit too crazy. <laughs> and we went, oh my gosh, we love your post. Can we repost it? And we did that. And guess what? These posts were one of our, these were the most successful posts that we did. When you go into Facebook Insight, you can rank them, you can see them sorted by number of shares or number of people that you reach. And these posts were always on the top um, because a lot of people are sharing them, a lot of people. And I, 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 have, I mean, if I'm being reposted by an organization, I would be really happy about it. And I would, tell you, I would be telling all my friends about it. And so we did it again with another um, coworker of mine. And she did her you know, reason of why I walk. Um, and it was, again, very successful. Um, I pulled up the numbers. We reached 
um, with this post, the first one that we did, we reached over a thousand people. 84 were engaged and 54 were talking about it. Facebook said talking about it just means the likes, comments, and shares that were in total. Um, and the rest were the same. We reached 800 to 1,000 people, and more than 50 people were talking for each post. And we were really happy about that, because that's huge, that we've never reached those numbers before in social media. Um, and again, with all the posts that we're doing, we always try to put blue in it. We always want to have a link linking back to our website or an article or something, because that's really important. Um, and um, the reason why we want to keep doing this is we want to recognize people who are doing our campaign. We really appreciate it. Um, we had a partner organization who did it, um, and so we re posted that on our wall as well, and they were thrilled um, because it's it's us helping them fundraise as well. It's us helping them get exposure um, while helping ourselves at the same time. And so that ends my presentation, and these are just the questions that we had. Um, so again, how, do, how can we be more engaging? How can we better use social media to motivate walkers and runners to, one, spread the word, and two, fundraise to their networks? Um, what other social media platforms should we be on? Maybe Google Plus. <laughs> Maybe we could do a hangout session. <laughs> um, you know, and how do we continue to build our audience? That's all, we always want more likes. We always want more people on our Facebook, our Twitter, reading our posts because that's my job, and I hope someone's reading what I'm posting. <laughs> Thank you. So, did you start the social media? I mean, you've only been there. You said what? Two, how long? Two weeks. Two months. Two months, and all this in two months. Is that it? I mean, because that's uh, there. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Well, that. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, so there's a question, and I would just want to just bring up, and I'm sure people will bring this out, but I, you know, the fact that you were able to find, you know, one campaign that's being very successful. I think one of the reasons that is is because it's very personal, and it's like homemade. It's like someone smiling next to a sign that they made, so it doesn't look like. You know, anything, it's just like people like that, that it feels like it came directly from that person. They're not shilling for something else, and it's, but it's the personal thing. So uh, you have, you know, that your cause is very, you know, personal to a lot of people. So I think you can continue to capitalize on that. But anyway, all right, we'll set it out to the floor. Oh, did you? No, it's not. So that's tough to. <laughs> my job, it's not my only job, right? <laughs> no. Yeah. No, it's definitely it's definitely really tough. Like yeah. I do have to consciously like take out half an hour of my day just to do it. Um and it's I mean it's time consuming. So and I have to be but then I'm on my phone all day. I hope I don't get in trouble with my boss. But I'm on my on my phone all day cuz there's an app and I'm checking it all the time to see if people have replied because um people do <laughs> Yeah. Yes. I feel like people expect you to. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So I put aside time to like schedule posts and do tracking, do kind of, that kind of thing. But throughout the day, I'm on my phone and trying to respond to people. So that's. Yeah. Okay. Um, does anyone so just because the uh, the walk is the is that's kind of your top tip top yeah. thing? So if, just before we get to the others, are there suggestions that are specific to the walk run? Let's take them first. You got one? No. Yeah, just first of all, congratulations! You're doing a great job. It's really really exciting to see that level of progress. Two, can I can you talk about what your fundraising goal for the walk is, um, or how much you raised last year, something along those lines? <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
the reason I ask is live part time in San Francisco, and I'm so jealous of the AIDS walk. They raise two and a half million dollars every year in San Francisco. But I just checked out their social media profiles, and both the foundation running it and the walk in total have about the same level of traction as you do. So rather than trying to expand, I'd probably focus most on leveraging okay. and also. I'd See if you can talk to them and see what they're doing. I, usually they're very helpful, like other peer organizations where there's not a competitive I thing. Them. I mean, just reach out and, and, and like guess email addresses and reach out and um, look, try and, and borrow their corporate sponsorship. They have a lot of national sponsors as their sponsors that look like their company's even headquartered here. Uh, so I would try to kind of parlay that into maximizing, but you're doing a great job. Thank you. Okay. I just want to say, um, use Facebook. I used to take uh, my Sunday school kids and did the AIDS walk every year. Well, when you have between eight and 15 kids, you need tools. And at the time we didn't have a lot of Facebook, um, I discovered a little red wagon. And this story, this wagon could tell you stories about being on the AIDS walk and what it's carried, the, the cases of water, the hand sanitizer for 15 kids using those stupid Johnny on the spots. Um, so I would just recommend your followers to tell stories of what they've learned to make the walk easier. Okay, go ahead. Um, also, since you said that a, a lot of the folks who are on your Facebook are your walkers and your supporters and whatnot, and you interestingly say that one of the things that you're trying to push are the statistics, but the real story behind the AIDS fund is the fact that you raise money that makes a difference. So why isn't that what you're really pushing? Why aren't you telling more about what their dollars are doing? And that is a way to encourage your walkers to raise more and to do more about that. I think we definitely are. Like, um, we recently posted an article on um, an FDA approval for um, a blend of four drugs into one. And at the end of the post, we said, you know, it's great that there are so many medical advances in this field, but at the same time, people who are affected by HIV still need you know, care services, legal services. And so we, again, illiterate saying we're raising money for organizations in the Delaware Valley to take care of people that way. So we always try to go back to, you know, when we do a news article, we try to tie back to us and we try to tie back to what we try to do to help the people in our community. But, um, but, so. but that sounds like, you know, if you do the pyramid, that's at the, I would flip that as the top. Okay. This is what we're doing. And then, mm -hmm. the, you know, the latest thing in, the, in that context, but always about this is what your dollars are doing. This okay. is what the money that that's you're really raising and the effort. Thank that's you. what it means. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you might even get some of the agencies, since you do partner with them very well, mm -hmm. to, to let them tell you how this money is, is helpful for them. Yeah. Well, Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, I'll just add one more thing and then we we'll, so I, you know, you're talking about the why I walk, um, as you're mentioning all the agencies, uh, you know, maybe you could encourage them to have their people just do the same thing, but they can just post it on their own sites, but then they can say, you know, that it's for the AIDS walk run, but then, then you're getting exposure also just outside. I mean, it's still social media. It's like the difference is like, is it on our property? Is it on somebody else's property? It's still benefiting you. So, I mean, you could do something like that. It looks like, you know, that's been such a big success. You've got 30 agencies. You have at least 30 people probably, you know, they have other people. You know, I would, I would go with that. I would, pardon the pun, but I would run with that at least, you know, for a while since you know that that's a big success. All right. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Right, but those funds, right, each, right, right, yeah, so each, right. Yeah, that's great, yeah, but I'm saying you have all those agencies, too. They have sites, they've got whatever they're, yeah, that's, oh, they are, okay, good, all right. Yeah, yeah, okay, good, yeah, so they just push that, you know, just like a time frame, something, whatever, share us or something, you know, worry, whatever, that kind of thing. All right, go ahead. Oh, oops, sorry, go ahead. Um, so as somebody who's going to be doing the 5K run, I've never run anything in my entire life before, so it's an adventure. Um, but most people aren't going to show up for the run and just do a 5K or walk 8K or 12K that day. They're training beforehand. And so one thing that I think I would find 
more engaging is to have maybe a post like once a week where it says, so are you going for a walk to get ready for the AIDS walk this week? Where, where are you going to do that? And then people can meet up and go for a walk together if they're not on part of, on one of the teams. Yeah, yeah. That's a really good idea. We have been doing research on like tips for walkers or runners. And because I found that to be more personal, like, hey, are you training for the 5K run here? Some tips kind of thing. So that's what we're planning to do in the next few Thank you. Okay, there was a, somebody. Oh, there you go. So, I guess the first thing I'm a little confused about is that you talked about your hashtag Why I Walk campaign, but everything that you showed were Facebook posts, and I thought hashtag campaigns I primarily see happening on Twitter. So, are you are you cross posting? Are you? Yeah. Okay. So. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, I guess... The We're primarily using the hashtag just to tag these posts. So I can go in and search for them. So if someone posts about anything to do with the AIDS walk and they tag either us or why walk, I can find it and repost right. it. Or So it's just a way for need to organize this no sure and i mean i think the the Sorry, end all well, it's not that confusing i guess the end all be all goal is always if you can get someone else posting with your hashtag yeah. that's the best post you're going to get because someone said earlier about it's not you know selling anything or asking for anything it's someone else contributing to that conversation and that's what you're trying to find so i just wanted to make sure that i understood so if you're new into twitter you might really want to if you're going to have this hashtag campaign on all your literature, you might want to really put some new energy there, especially if you get similar level of following that um, the walk in San Francisco does with their level of success. Would, you know, maybe it's time to really use this as a way to, to leverage Twitter in a big way, um, which is great. I mean, I think it's a great campaign. And I think one of the things that I would also point out is that any time you've got an image or a video, um, those posts are always going to get, way more attention I than that. anything text-based. Um, and when you're reposting articles, it's true. Anytime, any comment that you have on that article almost might not get read because people are going to look at the headline and they're going to click on that link and they're gone and they're off to the It doesn't make the articles less worthy. They're very worthy, but definitely want to make sure that you, know, you keep your message about that article very short if there's any chance of it getting absorbed. Okay. Um, so you have 30 partner organizations. Are you guys, are you working together to repost each other's content? Like you, you would be a great source every time anyone, you know, you could say like, hey, I'd like you to repost things from me specifically. I'm going to do the same for these 30 organizations to help amplify that voice and make sure that your audience knows who those 30 are by, by learning their tweets yeah. and I posts. Think, I think maybe my problem is I don't, I didn't communicate to the 30 organizations that are going to be doing it. Like, there's no written email or anything. But I have been, like, reposting anything that they have posted about us. So. But they, but, and that's fine. But, I mean, you guys might be able to. Yeah. You might be able to help each other just a little bit in that, like, if you've got a network of, you know, 31 counting yourself, even if they have very small audiences, I mean, unless you're talking about, like, 20 followers as opposed to 200, those could be 200 followers and 30 organizations you don't have. That's another 600 followers. That's actually significant in terms of increasing your message. So that was just the other – that was mainly it. And I do know – I recently read um, – Heather Mansfield has a book called Social Media for Social Good, uh -huh. which is – pretty pretty good book it's like a pretty basic primer but it has a chapter that i didn't pay much attention to because i don't do a lot of thons or walks uh -huh. um in my work but she focused on that and there's a lot of social media tools that you can give to like you know like you're doing your tumblr for team captains mm -hmm. like one of the things you could be doing on that is encouraging your team captains to post yeah. on the aids fund philly site facebook site to communicate with people like directing their teams to that page to make sure they're all liking it and following it 
as a source for information, particularly as you're getting closer to the walk. But I know there's a lot of tools that I can't think of the names of them that are in that book. Thank you. I'll definitely read that chapter. Uh, we have at least another minute to go here. Is that it? <laughs> really? Okay. All right. Well, that's very appropriate because we were just only had about another two minutes to go. So thank you to all our presenters. Um, it's very interesting what your organizations are doing and how you're all using social media. They seem to be in different stages and doing different things. So it's very informative to our group. And thanks to our crowd.